Speaking of controversies, something that didn't get as necessarily touched on with the proper context in this period, which is entirely on me, is the connection between all of this and Harry fucking Potter, which means we have to talk about J.K. fucking Rowling. So let me just get on record. J.K. Rowling is a horrible, hateful with the blood of bullied, terrorized, and murdered trans children, teens, and adults on her hands, and she can go fuck herself. She is a monster, a turf, and turfs are right next to Nazis, homophobes, Holocaust deniers, anti-vaxxers, anti-choices, and just ignorant, stupid, brainless, soul-sick motherfuckers of all types. Fuck her, fuck the people who support her. The only bigger bitch I know of is karma, and it's coming, you lady shit. Anyway, none of that had really manifested at this point, and also what hadn't gotten a ton of attention until it was too late was that Warner Brothers coasting on the Potter franchise and then not having it anymore was a bunch of the reason why the DCEU happened the way it did and why their business model fell off so abruptly. And that plus Ezra Miller being in the Fantastic Beast movies, yeah, that's why one of the episodes in this section is talking about that, because it is a piece of the overall puzzle. In any case, by this point, we're at the back half of 2018. The DCEU, as it was previously constituted, has crashed, burned, and we're watching the internal fight over what it's going to become take shape as the smoke clears. A few of these videos have already mentioned the release the Snyder Cut internet fandom having kicked up in the interim. You know, at this point, it wasn't being taken all that seriously. Basically, a dark, stupid, and fake version of the rehire James Gunn campaign, and this is back when you didn't have the Snyderbot army flooding out fake news about how there was a finished director's cut and various people involved were backing that up. Really didn't have the internal backlash alleging bad behavior against Joss Whedon and some of the executives hadn't fully taken shape yet as a bigger thing under themselves apart from the public fall of Joss Whedon aspect. So what was happening was the earliest version of the DCEU reorienting itself around what at the time was looking like a preview version of what ended up being delayed by several years and now under new management, but still, I know that sounds like a ramble and it's even more confusing in the episode, sort of feels like the same plan, a Flash movie loosely using the Flashpoint story premise as a way of rebooting the continuity and doing a bunch of new stuff to move on as fast and differently as possible from the mountain of failure bullshit that they just managed to bury the studio under multiple times over, a rock slide that was in part itself brought on by multiple mad scrambles to try and build another foundational franchise like they lost in the including Harry Potter brand. And amidst this, we also ended up with a new Batman, another new Joker, and Shazam.
I might change my mind if I had to think on it for significantly longer, but right now it really does feel like Fantastic Beasts The Crimes of Grindelwald was the worst movie I saw in 2018, especially when weighted against the pedigree of its franchise, the talent involved, and the sheer amount of money being shoved into its production. And as a nice change of pace, audiences seem to kind of agree and acknowledge it this time. I mean, it made money, but definitely not what they were looking for it to make, and I was far from the only critic who kicked the shit out of it this time. Hell, last time I saw a studio throw this much money behind the long-term plans of a mega franchise without stopping to ask, did anyone actually want this? Only to get thuddingly rebuked in both reviews and dollars, or lack thereof, it was Why did you say that name? It's his mother's name! Ah, uh, yeah couple of crummy years at Warner Brothers. And if you think about it, you can actually kind of blame the Harry Potter movies for all of this, thanks to the now rather definitively proven impossible to replicate circumstances of having a huge youth literature phenomenon, getting big, staying big, being enthusiastically endorsed as actually good for kids and tremendously merchandise friendly, sticking the landing, getting a massively complex undertaking of a long-term movie deal launched, executed, and also sticking the landing in the same relative time frame. Warner Brothers basically went a full decade with this one constantly releasing franchise and the occasional Batman movie, underwriting everything else the studio Studio wanted to do, and ever since that series concluded, they've been frantically flailing around trying to cobble together a replacement, some other new long-term thing that can just float there in the expense ledger, earning a billion dollars at the box office every year just by existing, hence why they went whole hog on the DC Extended Universe before waiting to find out how audiences would actually receive Zack Snyder's interesting take on that material. <laughs> Dead. Only to learn that the answer was, yeah, no, we're, we're good. We, we like the hot chick who ties people up and the mermaid guy, though, more of those maybe. So plan B is apparently, well, okay, let's just make more Harry Potter movies, with the complication being that J.K. Rowling has to sign off on anything they might want to do with the property, and it's not like they can just get the characters people care about back for more, not even to do like a movie of that cursed child thing, mostly because I'm pretty sure Daniel Radcliffe's automated outgoing message for when anyone from Warner Brothers calls is just the sound of Daniel Radcliffe's iPhone sinking to the bottom of the ocean, and they can't even really do prequels like Star Wars did, because anything genuinely interesting and a worth building a whole movie around sense about the backstory has already been covered in the movies they already made. So instead, we're watching a studio embarrass itself, hammering together an entire new franchise out of lightweight retcons, deep lore Wikipedia entries, and an Eddie Redmayne character who's kind of tertiary to the already completely tertiary stuff. And the only thing about it that really impresses me is that the bad filmmaking may have actually managed to blow this all up before the problem of the actual material being not very good did the job. But, like, pretty much all of the broader mythology stuff in the Harry Potter franchise that isn't in the direct orbit of the wizard school and the principal cast of kids and teachers from the main books really seems to suck, right? Like, a lot. But that was never really that huge of a deal before, because the franchise and the whole main story is about the kid going to a school and a reinvention of the very specific British juvenile literary tradition of the boarding school melodrama. The school functioned pretty perfectly as a closed universe narrative ecosystem to let that story and its themes play to a satisfying conclusion with the notion of what was going on in the broader outside world really only needing to intrude when it served a specific dramatic purpose, and if the outlines of that outside world and its history didn't always totally line up or fit together coherently, it didn't matter, because that's not what the goddamn story was about. It was about the kid going to the wizard school and gradually finding himself by even more gradually understanding that figuring out where he came from and the circumstances of his parents' background weren't necessarily going to solve all of his problems and the audience also learned, hey, getting to escape your shitty abusive normie family in crap-ass town for an awesome school for special people is a lovely fantasy, but also higher ed is still a viper pit of elitism, so keep your head on a swivel. Like, that was all very good stuff. Thematically, narrative, all worked. That's why it was so successful. Which is why it's almost incredible to note, even to me, who was not necessarily the biggest devotee of all things Harry Potter, why was Just Send Different Kids to the Goddamn Wizard School not the first idea they went with for sequels? I mean, wasn't like 90% of the reason this whole thing captured the imaginations of young readers and eventually filmgoers to begin with? The fantasy of, ooh, Wizard School, that sounds like a cool place to go. Isn't that what they've been merchandising and hyping and building that whole theme park around, fulfilling pieces of that specific specific fantasy? I'm gonna go shop in the place they buy school supplies. Let's go see the classrooms. I wonder which house that talking hat would say I belong in and what it says about my personality. Look, clearly it's not what J.K. Rowling wanted them to do for sequels because, you know, it's kind of obvious because they're not doing it, but this does seem like both the easiest call to make and also the only one that makes any real sense short of maybe let it rest a while and make movies about other stuff. Does it not? Am I nuts here? Because it seems like all the problems and complications and weird unforced errors this franchise keeps running into in terms of, like, changing culture, diversity, casting, we commit to Johnny Depp and now everyone's finally sick of him, all of that would be fairly easily solved in the context of, hey, welcome back to Hogwarts, that place you like, here's three or four new kids, or maybe just one to start since we're not wedded to a bunch of books that have already been written this time, and we can just 
just change things up based on what people seem to like, or whatever. Point is, we're going to do the cool stuff again, like the train and the hat and the brooms and the oceans, all the stuff you like, and we're going to have teachers that didn't like die come back, plus a new one. Wait, what's that? No, it's not just going to be the same story again, because these are different kids. Maybe one of them is a pain in the ass who likes skateboards and causes shenanigans. Maybe a kid who's super hardcore into the Quidditch. And you just do that for the whole arc of the movie instead of it just being a subplot, like Mighty Ducks style. Maybe there's a vampire. Wait, hold on. Vampires? Are vampires a thing in Harry Potter? They are, okay. Maybe there's a vampire. That's a thing you could do for one movie. I mean, anything has to be more interesting than following the great aunts and uncles of the supporting cast through a weird conspiracy story that's the prequel to the backstory to the main plot we already knew the ending to and already know none of this stuff is important in. No offense but I really don't care. They were supposed to make five more of these goddamn Fantastic Beast things, apparently that's still the plan, but after the way Grindelwald was received, I'm hoping the minor buzz that they'll think twice and wrap it all up in the next one turns out to be true, because if I am going to be stuck in film criticism for a while longer, I'd at least prefer to not be staring down the barrel of too many more of these things. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Twenty nineteen surprise hot new trend in blockbuster filmmaking appears to be ideas that sound like or were parody sketches in trailer form, but they're trailers for actual not a joke but the real thing movies. Starting with What If Dora the Explorer, but now it's Tomb Raider. I have to keep going no matter what. She's freaking awesome. Boots. Of course, she knows this monkey. And continuing with Joaquin Phoenix in Joker, a serious-minded prestige drama that reimagines a new origin story for a Batman villain apparently playing out in a grounded, realistic world without a Batman or any other superheroes, villains, or powers. And it looks... fine? Kinda potentially good, I guess? I don't know, this is such a bizarre idea, you kind of expect it to be either incredible or a disaster, and instead this looks, you know, like another dozen totally average movies about bitterly self-involved white guys going nuts and taking out their shit on a world that have descended in an unbroken line from Taxi Driver and the like since the late 70s and early 80s. I mean, I'm not saying it can't work as what it's trying to be, but apart from the clown makeup gimmick, you have to question what actually makes this a story that was demanding to be told again. The last half century of filmmaking is positively drowning in characters like this. I'm almost given to question whether trying to divorce the Joker, or at least the Hannibal Lecter by way of of Tom Ripley's psychopath mastermind version that's been popular from the 80s onward from the Batman mythology is ultimately misguided in the same way that trying to do the realistic standalone Punisher movies was, i.e. the Punisher isn't really an original character very much outside of seeing a character like that interacting with superheroes. Now look, I get it, the king of comedy but now even more like Taxi Driver and it's the Joker is not an illogical place to go with it. Okay, since I know even in film school they only make you watch three Scorsese movies now and none of them are this one and it's never on TV anymore. The King of Comedy was a dark comedy released in 1982. It stars Robert De Niro as a mentally unstable, struggling stand-up comic named Rupert Pupkin who takes a late-night talk show host played by Jerry Lewis, who's actually really good in this, by the way, hostage in order to force him to let Rupert perform a televised set on his TV show. Though not a box office success in its day, it's come to be thought of as an underappreciated work in the filmography of all involved and, depending on who you ask, is often suggested to have inspired, in some way, both Alan Moore's hypothetical failed comedian Joker origin from the Killing Joke story and the Joker-centric Batman the Animated Series episode make him laugh, so yeah. With this, but it also feels like we're going to a place where we're either supposed to like Joker or even sympathize with him, or that whole circa 2008 edgelord meme bullshit about how when you grow up you realize the Joker is the one who makes more sense, which is just the most exhaustingly idiotic take from just the most tiresome kind of fanboy. Well, maybe second most tiresome after the ones who are still protesting the studio to blow millions to finish the even worse version of Justice League. I am so tired. Now look, I get how the Joker ended up gradually turning into one of these characters charismatic psychopath characters that Hollywood and popular fiction have both been way too in love with for the last 50 or 60 years or so, even as the character originally was more just a gangster, professional criminal type with a strange facial deformity and a mystery as to where he came from and why he looked like that. He became THE Batman villain pretty much because he was the original gimmick bad guy in Batman number 1. The whole scary clown gimmick always kind of works historically, and they really did hold fast to the whole we're keeping the backstory a mystery business, apart from at one point revealing he'd previously been an unheard of villain called the Red Hood who fell in 
and some acid, and that probably explained the clown face stuff, but nothing else before that. So he was enough of an open book to never really go out of style and fit pretty much wherever they wanted to put it. And then when it became trendy to turn as many top-tier recurring comic book villains as possible, from gangsters, bank robbers, and mad scientists who like to play dress-up into just straight-up serial killers in the 80s who also like to play dress-up, Joker was one of the easiest of the big guns to make that happen with because, you know, murder clown was a thing that had actually happened in real life a few times by then. And then Killing Joke happened, and that was pretty much the default Joker persona ever since, even though it doesn't really hold up all that well, and even Alan Moore considers it one of his lesser works. Or at least the version that every other version seems to use as a jumping-off point. But the funny thing about Killing Joke, whatever else you can say about it, is it's one of the only versions of this whole egomaniacal psychopath monologuing about his personal philosophy routine that really understands that type of person in an honest way, because despite so many fanboys only taking a surface-level appreciation of how gritty and violent the story was, and what an edgy move it was to cripple and maybe, maybe not off-camera sexually assault Batgirl, and what a badass this made the Joker, and by extension Batman himself for fighting him, the whole overriding point that Killing Joke not only keeps hammering at in the backstory, the origin, the content of Joker's speechifying, and even the whole denouement that it builds to is that the Joker, like every other smarmy, disaffected nihilist who thinks they've cracked the code of life by virtue of detachment, is actually just kind of pathetic. If you only know it by reputation, the plot of The Killing Joke involved Joker abducting Commissioner Gordon and tormenting him with a slideshow of Joker and his henchmen shooting and mutilating his daughter Barbara, aka Batgirl. Intercut with this and Batman's attempt to rescue Gordon, we get flashbacks to what may be Joker's actual origin as a failed stand-up comic whose crummy but not that unhappy life completely falls apart through a series of dumb random accidents all on the same day that he's tricked into wearing the Red Hood costume by some crooks and falls into the acid because he's frightened by Batman, completing his descent into madness and turning him into the Joker. The hook, though, is that we are seeing this origin because Joker's torture of Gordon is meant to be a demonstration, proving what has apparently been the premise of Joker's whole otherwise random career of disconnected crimes, schemes, etc. over the years. That life and the world are random and cruel and pointless, and anyone, even a fine upstanding citizen like Gordon, is just one bad day with enough trauma in it away from snapping just like he did. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, why would Joker care about proving anyone could turn into Joker if he supposedly doesn't feel guilt about being the Joker? Well, pour yourself an extra drink. You just understood the point of this book better than most of the people who claim to love it. Because it didn't work. He's not broken, everyone isn't one step away from being the Joker, and he probably wasn't just a regular, perfectly good guy with nothing wrong with him, even if he did get a raw deal that day. And as Batman points out, all the grandiose how-I-see-the-world bullshit the Joker has been lecturing about the whole time is actually really dumb, just a bunch of edgy, angry teenage crap that every smug crank with delusions of grandeur thinks they're the first person to figure out. He even starts in on World War II was caused by telegraph poles and German war debt, in case you were worried they'd be too subtle about this. But I I mean, really, to miss this, you'd have to be one of those people who doesn't get that Fight Club isn't about emasculated, overcompensating, white-collar dweebs secretly being charismatic, sexy, badass god-kings, but rather about said badass god-kings not existing and just being emasculated, overcompensating dweebs you should never listen to. And also, you know, the Project Mayhem guys were literally skinheads. Like a monkey ready to be shot into space. Space monkey. Ready to sacrifice himself for the greater good. And yeah, that tends to be the same dude who misses the point here, and even though more than a few of them are good, I really have a hard time, especially at this particular moment in time, not to put too fine a point on it, right? Getting all that excited for another movie where a weird loner rambles about how unfair the world is, and how that renders whatever insane shit he's gonna do, either reasonable or righteous or whatever. I'm not saying this is gonna be bad, I have no idea. We've seen one trailer, the cast is good, Phoenix is a hell of an actor, Todd Phillips is an interesting director, they got De Niro to come back and do a part in the movie as a shout-out to King of Comedy, I like the reimagine Joker look, and good lord anything is better than more Jared Leto. And it's unfair to hold internet weirdo fanboys who are stupidly obsessed with the Joker character for dumb reasons against a movie. It just feels like one of those instances where someone went to a studio with an interesting idea and got an okay fine, but only if you deliver the least interesting version of it. But I guess we'll find out. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Oh yes indeed, folks, this is not a drill. We have white smoke from the chimney at 3400 Warner Boulevard over Burbank, send a raven to Gotham, drop an early tip to the Newsboy Legion, and scatter the ceremonial Martha Pearls in the appropriate alley that the box office gods might bless us with bountiful domestic gross and a decent 3D multiplier on the China back end. A new Batman has been selected. Evidently official as of this recording, the successor to the cowl following the abdication of his Batness Affleck I of Boston shall be...
Robert Pattinson, previously of the Twilight films. Huh. Wonder how that went over with the fanboys. So not well. But okay, apparently this is now the situation. The 33-year-old actor will reportedly take up a three-movie deal at Warner Brothers starting with the debut under writer-director Matt Reeb, currently titled The Batman, which will reportedly be a smaller scale, less spectacle-driven take on the property focused on detective work, mystery solving, and the underworld crime thriller elements featuring multiple Batman villains, and will all but certainly be a complete reboot or soft reboot, disconnected from the most recent Ben Affleck incarnation of the character, with Pattinson as a younger Bruce Wayne near the beginning or midpoint of his career rather than the aging, unretired version. At this point being unclear what that means about the ongoing continuity of the DC Extended Universe with the previously Affleck Batman adjacent Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Suicide Squad, and Harley Quinn franchises still ongoing, but Henry Cavill also having apparently snapped his last neck as Superman. Gee, don't everyone beg him to stick around all at once, huh? Oh, and also no one knows if this has anything to do with the weird alternate universe Joker in a realistic world where there isn't a Batman Joker movie hitting in October. Anyway, that's all anyone really knows because they just settled on who's going to play the main character, so it's not like there's really anything else you could say or parse out about the project itself. Will it be good? Who knows? I hope so. Could it be good? Sure. Overall, the Batman movies have averaged out mostly okay. Matt Reeves has made good movies before, so it could absolutely happen. I mean, Stranger Things have. Sure, Warner Brothers is in this weird juggling act because they completely f***ed up what sounded like a sure thing in the planning stages and made a bunch of just terrible DC movies almost all in a row early on, but apart from Justice League and those Fantastic Beast things, the studio's tentpole track record has been really solid as of late. I mean, Detective Pikachu was good, Wonder Woman was good, Godzilla 2 and Shazam were both excellent, so the odds are kind of in its favor on the production end. And to be honest, apart from the immediately omnipresent reflexive, aw, wah, a decade ago he was in bad movies that were trendy to be way too invested in performatively hating aspect of this, the main deflationary part of the patents and announcement that I can see at this point is that it feels like an overly familiar choice by now. For months, rumors had circulated that production might have been looking to take a big swing and cast significantly against the traditional Batman archetype for the new guy, with rising new millennium superstars like Michael B. Jordan and Henry Golding even being floated as possible candidates. By contrast, Robert Pattinson feels like an almost absurdly safe choice. Oh, wow, a tall, handsome white guy with a distinctive jawline who pounces all the time. Way to think outside the box on that one. But assuming he's given a good script and well-directed, I see no reason why he shouldn't be able to more than acquit himself in this part, like multiple other other guys fitting that description have acquitted themselves as Batman already. He's certainly a good enough actor. No, not in Twilight, but nobody was. Also, as is the case with co-star Kristen Stewart, Pattinson has largely spent the last decade since those movies taking advantage of having gotten A-list blockbuster fame and fortune right out of the gate by largely avoiding jumping into another big franchise project, and instead building a rock-solid resume of interesting, challenging roles in offbeat, independent, and arthouse films like Cosmopolis, Maps of the Stars, The Rover, Queen of the Desert, High Life, and this year's buzzworthy festival horror circuit offering The Lighthouse under god-tier legendary directors like Vern Herzog, David Cronenberg, and Claire Denis. Hell, he's already signed up for Christopher Nolan's top-secret spy thriller project, Tenet, in 2020. And yet, to quote-unquote fans who've already been tearing their hair out, stomping their feet, and drafting petitions in a rage over this, none of that matters. What matters is, he's the guy from Twilight! And Twilight was a series of not-very-good movies that a way-too-big segment of the mainline, mostly younger male film geek chattering class got way too devoted to hating, and so both it and its supposedly worst thing that ever happened fanbase had to be destroyed through abject mockery, with the fact that the movies and corresponding books were both pretty bad, and also were were uncomfortably retrograde in their presentation of relationship politics serving as the fig leaf of justification for going so over the top with the merciless pounding. But, you know, along with the sobering and necessary introspective reappraisal that necessarily emerges from remembering that yes, we, as in many of us as a collective part of the mainstream popular culture, really did spend over half a decade rhetorically beating up on teenage girls by telling them that they were the big stupid cancer on civilization because a thing they liked was more popular than we felt it deserved to be, being a good-for-the-soul searching kind of thing, I also genuinely feel like it's present in a roundabout way is one of the strongest indicators that casting this particular role in this particular way means the Batman might actually be on the right track. See, again, I can't sugarcoat this because I'm keenly aware to an extent early on I took part in some version of this and I feel kind of guilty and shitty about it in retrospect. I mean, not as shitty as I feel about the hyperbolically personal ways the Michael Bay Transformers reviews got at the time or the way uncool early 2000s ironic sexism jokes in my review of Jennifer's Body. The Twilight movies, books, etc. were all pretty bad and there was a lot of legit technical, philosophical, ideological criticism to be levied 
at them, but the en masse organized Twilight hate backlash especially aimed at the fans was overwhelmingly a gross nerd misogyny gatekeeping flex that was all about being pissed off at the idea that someone had gone and found an audience for vampire, werewolf, superhuman power genre entry that eschewed the traditional straight male geek audience for such genre stuff in favor of an unapologetically direct appeal to a younger female sensibility and the female gaze in its presentation of strength and sexuality, even if it was being filtered through a Mormon housewife sort of vanilla spank bank fantasy. And to a large part, even though they don't necessarily interact directly in the on-screen narrative, the very particular gatekeepy attitude in question is very much of a kind to the everything must be insecurely aggressive and hypermasculine audience and sensibility that Warner Brothers initially faltered with the DCAU by chasing after and pandering to with the likes of Batman v Superman, Suicide Squad, and a lot of Man of Steel. By contrast, being willing or even eager to invoke the predictably impotent rage of such an audience via this casting and follow through with it suggests that either the people making the decisions for this film now are so confident in their take that they simply don't care what the internet rage machine thinks, or that they do care and in fact specifically set out to antagonize that part of the audience as part of reshaping the brand identity away from its associations with the worst of toxic fanboy culture. In other words, either the people behind the Batman either don't care that casting Edward from Twilight as Bruce Wayne is guaranteed to piss off the absolute worst kind of Batman fanboys, or they do care and they want to establish as early as possible that this version is the opposite of what that often toxic fan culture wants it to be. And while everything else about this project is one big gigantic unknowable, either of those positions is very much the right place to be starting from. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. If not for the mostly impressive modern looking special effects, Shazam would feel completely like a movie from a different time. Not in the sense that it's a throwback to the way the character was conceived in Fawcett Comics almost 90 years ago. This is actually a fairly modern 21st century take on the concept, characters, mythology, etc. that profoundly gets what's made them timeless without relying on anachronistic nostalgia. Instead, the earlier era Shazam sensibilities feel to have hailed from are the mid-90s, back when superhero movies, apart from Batman maybe, were shaggy and rough around the edges, but also frequently loose and playful, built more around the character's central novelty and supporting cast rather than how much of a panel-to-screen sizzle reel one could get together for Comic-Con. It's an imperfect movie that feels too long in some spots and undercooked in others, but ends up being part of its charm, the kind of movie that feels like people making it couldn't believe what they were gonna get away with. The resulting film is one that I just honestly can't say enough good things about. Shazam is easily one of the best, most unique, original, and different superhero movies to hit in a while. A bold breath of fresh air that feels like all the best parts of the classical foundations of the genre, but also a wholly separate thing from anything else in the zeitgeist. It's a fun, family-friendly action comedy, but it's got a weight and a sense of meaning to it that the funnier Marvel movies tend to avoid, while also being more sincere and earnest than most of the DC movies have been. It's not dark, but it's mischievous. Think Ghostbusters, Goonies, Men in Black, the Middle Years Harry Potter movies. See, there's a grittiness here, but not the performative, edgy, insecurity sense that defines that word in most of these movies. It's, it's authentic grit, sincerely informed by the working-class Philadelphia setting and characters. Billy and Freddy do a lot of their adventuring in underpasses, alleys, junkyards, etc., but you never feel like the film is straining for atmosphere. It's because they're kids and they're poor. I love that Billy is realistically standoffish and traumatized by the way he's had to grow up but still recognizably a child and then recognizably a child trying to do an impression of what he thinks a grown-up is as Shazam when played by Zachary Levi in a muscle suit. I love that Freddy gets to be a character who is disabled kid but allowed to be kind of a dick about that fact that this is his life. You never see that in any movies and it's refreshing. The other kids in the foster group home are great fleshed out characters, they're diverse in age, background gender type without feeling like a checklist and they have a really fun role to play in the story. Cooper Andrews and Marta Milans are terrific as the parents who give off a great subtle vibe of these are like the sweetest possible people you could ever hope to meet, but also I would not mess with them. And you know, it's not like the movie hangs a big neon, look at how socially redeeming we are, sign on itself about this, but most of the time when you see the adoption system or a foster family in movies, it's either negative or if it's positive, it's rich people with a lot of extra resources helping out as a project, but this isn't that. You know, Shazam gives us this working class, diverse foster family in a group home that's jammed and messy and a little bit chaotic, but functioning and supportive and positive. And for narrative reasons, that works because the story needs us to work out emotionally that this is a real home that Billy should be fighting for a little bit before he gets that. But it's also just really good to see, you know? And I get the sense that people, maybe a lot of people, will see themselves, aspects of themselves, their community, neighborhood, etc., presented in ways they usually aren't in this movie. And that's pretty cool. Now, the 
superhero action stuff kicks ass as well, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about it less because, honestly, like, 80% of it didn't make it into the trailers, and I don't want to give it away. There's a really cool mix of practical and digital effects, nice balance between comedy and serious action, and big fight scenes, the flying and super strength gags are nice, and all the more since it's clear they didn't have all the money in the world to spend on this, and they got creative with it. But, yeah, more than half of the big action stuff, including most of the bad guy stuff in the entire third act, Shazam gives audiences a lot of movie for one ticket, especially if you brought the whole family, because there really is something in here for everybody. This is a fun, funny, exciting, action-packed, thrilling, big-hearted, sincerely felt family adventure movie that rates with the best of the superhero genre, and honestly, what minor critiques I might have about clunky exposition or villain screen time feel cancelled out by how overwhelmingly the majority of it works and how magnificently all the threads coalesce for that all-time blowout of a third act. So, yeah, I'm gonna say four stars. Shazam is a terrific movie. I loved it. Everybody should go see this. I had a blast. Uh, so yeah, all these years later, I'm more convinced than ever that I was on the right side of history when it came to Joker. We'll see how Joker 2 comes out. I'm also still very fond of the first Shazam movie. It's still a good movie. I love the kids, I love the updated mythology, and I genuinely think this is the franchise out of all of them that got fucked by COVID more than anything else. Uh, anyway, we're now up to the point, circa 2019 or so, where the CWDC series are really feeling, you know, big in their saddle for a minute there. They had good ratings and reviews, a solid cross-series fan base cooking. It was very difficult to argue that they weren't crushing it on both fan management and generally solid genre work, where the movie side of the equation kept falling down on the job, so the producers there got it in their heads that since the feature side of the company was definitely not going to get around to even partway adapting the brand's most iconic storyline for anything anytime soon, you know, maybe they'd just go ahead and do Crisis on Infinite Earths as a giant TV crossover event and get everyone's dander up. So naturally, here's our coverage of when all that went down. So the popular conception when it comes to superhero movies, yes, we're still talking about that because the economics of internet broadcasting are what they are. Have it your way. Is that while Marvel and Disney are doing very, very well, DC and Warner Brothers generally are not, which while good for internet comedy in a nice shorthand, isn't precisely accurate. In truth, balance sheet wise, Warner Brothers is probably getting more mileage out of the DC superhero brand as a whole now than they have at any other point in time. True, Disney's Marvel Cinematic Universe features are largely to thank for keeping the genre at the top of the pop culture heap over the last decade, but amid the superhero saturated culture, WB has done more than all right for itself. DC Heroes headline an entire successful programming block that effectively anchors the CW. Lego Batman was a more successful follow up to the Lego movie than the actual follow up to the Lego movie, Teen Titans Go, is one of the biggest shows in kids' TV, and their theatrical movie turned to tidy profit. The direct video animated features based on classic comic stories have proved highly successful. The brand supports multiple popular toy lines, including the hugely successful DC Superhero Girls and its own spin off series. And while the business model of their streaming platform might need some work, Doom Patrol has been pretty solid, while Titans was. Where's Batman? Ah! Fuck Batman memorable, so they've at least got variety going for them, which unfortunately means that their real major stumbling block hasn't been the lack of quality, though there is plenty of that, but rather a lack of consistency. The most genius move Marvel pulled off with its big continuity experiment was managing to get audiences to associate a general baseline of shared connections with a general baseline of shared quality. The DC projects have not been so fortunate in that regard, with multiple different tracks constantly competing for attention, and their studio boss's big push toward a Marvel-style shared universe mega-franchise winding up as a disastrous boondoggle likely to go down as one of the most disliked blockbusters of the decade Why did you say that name? and a belly flop so disappointing that there's essentially an entire internet religion growing up around insisting that a mythical better version just must somehow exist and whose good entries now include in total wonder woman which runs out of gas in act three aquaman which depending on who you ask is either one of the most absurdly stupid relentlessly nonsensical movies of its size ever released to theaters and therefore bad call me Ocean Master. Or, one of the most absurdly stupid, relentlessly nonsensical movies of that size ever released to theaters and therefore good, and Shazam, which really, honestly, was just almost perfect. Like, could very well be the second best superhero movie this year. Seriously, if you didn't see it when it was out, it's on DVD now, give it a look. It was great. But okay, the DC movies, even if it feels like they're kind of figuring out what they maybe need to be at this point, they still have the problem of feeling like they're either all over the place or attached to stuff that's all over the place, and maybe that's not great for perception. Not so much that they've got too many versions of the characters running around. This 
isn't like the Marvel situation where apart from Spider-Man and maybe the Hulk, the MCU movies were most people's first introduction to these characters, the world is used to there being more versions of Batman and Superman and, okay, really just those two, but the point stands. No, the problem this creates for them is that when your product is this extricable from one another and so much of the highest profile actually connected stuff is considered bad and has already started to fall apart, the fact that they can already skip a lot of the other stuff makes it harder to convince anyone that there's anything that's not a slam dunk worth trying out. Unlike Marvel, who can get audiences who might otherwise not care for a wizard movie to go see their wizard movie because it might have a connection to their favorite spaceship movie. Oh, and the continuity they did attempt to establish is already starting to break apart. Shazam enthusiastically reinforces that it takes place in what we'd previously called a DC Extended Universe after the events of Justice League, and Aquaman also mentions that all of that apparently still happened, but people like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman still being out there, but here in reality, Henry Cable has escaped to go and star in the Witcher TV show, while not only is Ben Affleck no longer Batman, they've already recast the part with Robert Pattinson, and he'll be playing a new, younger Bruce Wayne in basically another reboot. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan either, but Affleck was the bomb in Phantoms. Word, bitch, Phantoms like a mall fucker. What's up now? Wonder Woman 84, meanwhile, is set in the mid-80s, as the title implies, but if and when these stories sync up again, oh, and uh, no one can seem to give a straight answer yet as to whether or not James Gunn's Suicide Squad 2 or Birds of Prey or the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn are actually connected in any meaningful way to Suicide Squad, the first one, there's likely to be an entirely new Batman and Superman, but the same Wonder Woman and maybe the other two guys, so what's the story now? This isn't like the 80s, where if you were going to keep a franchise going after a movie everyone hated, you just pretended you never made that one and kept going, like with Freddy's Revenge and Jaws 3. Fans won't have it, and it'd be kind of bad form to make the the good and or successful properties start over from scratch as well. On the other hand, one more extreme but paradoxically more historically fan-pacifying approach might also be found in the 80s via the comic book birthplace of all this superhero pandemonium. Fans of the CW Arrowverse franchises know that the brand has taken to hosting yearly miniseries team-up events across multiple shows utilizing DC Comics' old multiverse concept in order to write around Supergirl having to take place in an alternate universe from the rest because she started on another network, with the shocker finish of last year's event dropping a big reveal about what was coming up next time. Tell me this deranged doctor of yours isn't going to be a bigger problem. Deacon? Why? Because I hear he's made a friend. Don't worry, Doctor. Everything is as it should be. The stage is set. Worlds will live. Worlds will die. And the universe will never be the same. Okay, uh, so, uh, crisis, uh, Okay, so right here is where there was going to be like a live-action skit thing going into way more detail about the history of this, but the episode ran long, so we're going to do that next time, probably, unless something newsworthy happens. So for now, short version, DC used to have a bunch of their ancillary characters spread over a bunch of different alternate universes, which was pretty interesting some of the time, but also pretty confusing a lot of the time. Crisis on Infinite Earth was a 1985 mega-series, the storyline of which concluded with all the different timelines collapsing into one thing, and more or less all the redundant versions of all the various characters doing the same, except for all the ones who got just deleted from existence, and the Flash and Supergirl who both got killed. Now they fudged at this, picked at it, undone it, redone it, refined it, revamped it over the years, but basically when DC says crisis, they mean they're getting ready to put some things together and make other things retroactively never have happened. Make sense? Well, it actually doesn't make more sense when I spell it out, I promise. Comics! are weird! But can TV and movies afford to be? Almost no one actually thinks the CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths will be a company-wide thing in the same vein as the comic. First off, it's the CW series, they're not the biggest game in town. Black Lightning is already confirmed to be remaining in its own pocket universe, it's not clear whether the streaming shows like Titans or Doom Patrol will get a nod, and the animated Titans, various Batman cartoons, Justice Leagues probably won't be involved, though I wouldn't put it past them to briefly Forrest Gump the Legends of Tomorrow into footage from the Adam West Batman, George Reeves Superman, Linda Carter Wonder Woman for a quick gag, especially since Burt Ward is supposed to turn up possibly along with Carter and Tom Welling, it's not clear who they're playing or if he's playing an older Robin or whatnot. And Brandon Routh is apparently going to do Superman again, though the internet seems to think it's a Kingdom Come reference, and it's not a sure thing that he's playing the same Superman from Superman Returns, who was also supposed to be the same Superman as Christopher Reeve. Wait, is the little kid from Superman Returns going to be Superboy Prime? <laughs> Crap, this is running long. But in any case, the current movies are probably too expensive to rate an appearance either way. One would have to imagine if they were going to pull Gal Gadot off set to fly out to Vancouver and shoot a cameo, we'd have heard about it by now. But they could get a mention, maybe? Well, see, what a lot of fans are assuming is the main reason they're invoking the crisis in the naming scheme here is because they'll be using the story to tie up plot threads, mainly closing the book on Arrow itself, but also collapsing Supergirl's universe in with the others because there really isn't a reason not to at this point, and it seems even likelier amid the teasing that Supergirl and Batwoman will have a lot of interaction in the coming seasons.
<laughs> oh, what? I'm not allowed to help for things? I'm sure he's really proud of you. X-ray vision. You really do have a lot of tattoos. And somehow I feel like Cara Danvers doesn't have a single one. You know, it's such a shame I have to go. Because I feel like we would make a good team. World's finest. Good night, everybody! But okay, that suggests CW's Crisis might be planning to make good on the worlds will live, worlds will die part of this whole concept, potentially using the time-resetting, universe-reshaping shenanigans as an excuse to take a mulligan on ideas and concepts across the whole brand and say, oh, this, that, and the other thing that you didn't like, that never happened now. New timeline, butterfly effect, somebody stepped on a bug in prehistoric times, hyperspace, hypertime, sports almanac, whatever. And wouldn't it be something if they were to just randomly drop the identifying clips from Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Justice League into the universe that ceased to be montage, and the movies just plowed ahead after that, like they'd been doing in the default answer to any continuity thing from this point on was, nope, nope, hey, that was erased in the crisis. Never happened. That's really a cheat, isn't it? I guess you're right, Principal Tamzarian. I'll just be moving along, Lisa. Snowball too. I mean, that's probably not how they're going to do it. More likely, they'll dance around it thematically in each individual movie until they've got a new lineup people like enough that they won't care how the issue gets ignored. On the other hand, the CW shows have arguably been in an overall better position than the film side for some time, not just in quality and critical reception, but in positioning. It's noteworthy that the DCEU's only outright success stories have been the female-fronted Wonder Woman, the controversially reimagined lead in Aquaman, and the decidedly multicultural family-centric Shazam, and whereas the Marvel movies have been getting major credit lately for going on a big diversity push after Black Panther took them all the way to an Oscar nomination, this TV project has been there for years. Ruby Rose has been playing an openly gay Batwoman as in the comics, and Supergirl has TV's first transgender superhero as a recurring character in Dreamer. So from a certain perspective, it might be the ideal optics to, however briefly, elevate and center this progressive, forward-looking particular vision of a DC universe as the prime standard, adjacent to declaring another version of it relegated to the bad idea bin, or at least no longer part of the plan. As a way of saying implicitly, the future of what we're doing looks a lot more like this than that whole other thing ever did. It would definitely be an interesting precedent, and and as much as you know it'd make a lot of people pretty upset, I think it'd be pretty damn funny myself. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. And yeah, another case of where, if anything, I was kind of selling the TV guys short of exactly how ambitious they were going to end up getting, right? Because a ton of that, they'll never do that stuff right there, ended up kind of happening. What do you know? Now, on the movie side, there were significantly less fun things happening, at least from my end, as this is when Jokamania was sweeping the nation, or at least the narrative that was being insisted upon, and so we took to covering that. Looking at the trailer, reviewing the movie, eventually discussing its award season prospects, and the whole tedious narrative around that shit, what a fucking mess. I basically stand by everything that I have to say about it here. I think the only thing I might change is that I'd spend less time talking about it in general because really, does it feel like that movie had that much of an impact? I know that eventually the sequel trailer is going to drop and we're all going to talk about it again, but like, I'm recording this on May 1st of 2023. Does it feel like anyone talks that much about the fucking Joker movie? I also included a pair of episodes that touched on the then-newsworthy items about Superman and Wonder Woman, uh, movie news that broke around the same time, i.e. winter, heading into the new year for 2020. For context and chronology, since uh, those of you keeping track of time, yeah, this is right where your oh no, they have no idea what's coming, somebody please warn them alarms should be going off. God, okay, I have to talk about Joker a lot this week, don't I? I can't remember the last time I was this annoyed by the discourse over a movie I was this genuinely excited to see, which, as of this writing, hasn't happened yet, but will by the time many of you are eventually watching this. I gotta hand it to Warner Brothers. Whoever in their marketing and publicity department suggested they could not only overcome the typical rabid superhero fanboy tendency to aggressively resist film that radically retcon character origins, disconnect properties from the rest of their franchise, dramatically change visual and design aesthetics, and more recently further break up the continuity flow of a cinematic universe can see, but in fact neutralize, harness, and convert that resistance into support by simply reviving the long-abandoned 1990s this is the movie your mom doesn't want you to see sales gimmick deserves all the promotions because it clearly worked president of hag it's bad enough that sega genesis has the most 16-bit games but this new sonic the hedgehog oh he really ducked my doilies and about his attitude smarty pants why can't it be more like that nice boy mario Woo! oh <laughs>
Yes, like a 16-bit video game publisher with a mildly transgressive mascot platformer in need of differentiation, Warner Brothers and a gleefully complicit entertainment press have been able to transform What If Taxi Driver, but also things from Batman, I guess, from a marketing-savvy brand extension exercise, which may or may not also be an excellent film, and showcase for a career-redefining performance by Joaquin Phoenix, as many have said, again, I haven't seen it, those two aren't mutually exclusive, to a cause by leaning hard on a handful of critics questioning the potentially unfortunate timing of what looks to be yet another sympathetic narrative of a detached loner psychopath getting even with the world movie being released in a moment when real-life instances thereof are increasingly and more directly connected to extreme political ideology, bigotry, and acts of mass violence, and at least seemingly a relative handful of isolated expressions of concerns from law enforcement about copycats of the Aurora shooting incident from years back, positing the modestly budgeted soft-launch pilot feature for the DC Black spin-off movie banner from the director of The Hangover and Road Trip as some kind of edgy arthouse pipe bomb, a dangerous and subversive movie that the man just doesn't want you to see because you don't want to hear all those truths that's going to be spitting, and whereby you are in fact taking part in case the soaring triumphal and orchestral music hitting crescendo over those montage shots of people rioting in big groups and curtains parting and the main character walking confidently framed by backlight didn't clue you in, in a revolutionary action simply by supporting it, by going to see it, and buying tickets. Preferably on opening weekend, either Friday or Saturday night, when the hard count matters most. With your money. Most of which goes to them. The movie studio. Warner Brothers. Part of Warner Media LLC, a very, very large subsidiary of the staggeringly huge AT&T multimedia conglomerate. <laughs> That's not to say that all big studio movies don't primarily have a profit motive, at least in the eyes of their studios for the most part, or that Joker wasn't produced with any higher artistic aspirations. That's clearly not the case. It's just also clear that apart from what seems to be a somewhat broad, we live in a society level of sociopolitical grandstanding in its narrative, those aspirations don't seem to primarily have been to become a metaphorical brick through the window of entertainment media wokeness or a rallying point for people fed up with whatever it is middle class suburban youth without actual problems but who are angry anyway get fed up about these days. In fact, director Todd Phillips, in an interview with the rap Sharon Waxman said that he didn't make the film to push buttons, instead describing his pitch to Phoenix as a way to sneak a real movie in the studio system under the guise of a comic book film, and let's make a real movie with a real budget and we'll call it effing Joker. Though Phillips has leaned into the apparent studio strategy of pushing buttons on the media by later blaming the film's pushback on the far left, whatever that means in an American context. So yeah, and also I kinda wonder who gets to tell James Mangold, Matthew Vaughn, Ryan Coogler, Taika Waititi, Robert Rodriguez, Patty Jenkins, Christopher Nolan, James Gunn, Shane Black, and Guillermo del Toro, among others, that they didn't make real movies, but that's for another time, I guess. Now, it's also not as though Joker is even the first recent comic book-inspired movie to bank on topicality for putting itself over the rim at the box office. Marvel Studios and Disney made a point of opening Black Panther during Black History Month and enthusiastically promoted and signal-boosted the phenomenons of families and friends and groups attending the film in both cosplay and heritage attire, global audiences doing the same, and schools and youth groups organizing charity screenings of the film, all of which which, you know, along with being a pretty damn good movie, helped turn the film into not only another billion-dollar Marvel smash, but a genuine cultural touchstone and the first superhero movie ever nominated for picture. And Warner Brothers' own Wonder Woman, especially at its moment of original release, was very much positioned by many fans and media pundits as a chance to see a big-scale fantasy of female empowerment following the defeat and denial of what many had expected to be the first woman presidency of the United States, a meme that was so culturally pervasive at the time that it earned the film an episode-length scathing dressing down from the Chapo Trap House podcast. <laughs> bourgeois individualism, yeah, yeah. but every everything, it was it, it fit in extremely well with like empowerment style feminism, where it's just like, the only reason you would ever fail at anything is because you don't know how awesome you are. I mean, every, almost every line in this with that showcase to be one of those lines. Uh, the script was written from basic bitch Instagram memes. It was Charming. It's also not to say that there's no such thing as genuine outrage or offense when it comes to movies or any sort of media, or legitimate reason to stand up in passionate defense of the same. The fact that the movie studios and the marketing publicity divisions of, of corporate media are in the business of manipulating and exacerbating people's actual reactions or legitimate concerns in order to maximize their business one way or the other doesn't mean that there can't ever be a truly spontaneous reaction either way. Believe it or not, even the most dedicated and insidious propagandist in the modern era understands that they're running a flea circus, not a puppet show, meaning they're mostly waiting for the people to tell them what's going to make the people react or not. So, before we all formulate our hot takes about the first comic book movie, serious, dark, psychological, complex drama for real, mature, grown-up, big boys since... It, the last several and until the next one, and especially before you throw an internet mantrum about someone else's take, maybe stop and ask yourself, am I really as upset as I think I am, or am I letting the constant static from one of the biggest producers of such on the planet prod me into doing their marketing for free? And if so, isn't the joke really on me? I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Well, alright. 
I was really hoping we were done with the whole grim and gritty realism thing, and yeah, the director is making an asshole of himself in the press and social media for no reason, which is never a great sign, but this is a pretty interesting idea for a spin-off movie. The trailers have been promising, Joaquin Phoenix looks interesting, and I can see how this would open up the genre to fun and alternative takes and a space for people to really stretch within the studio system, so yeah, I've been looking forward to this, I'm optimistic, let's see what you got, Joker. Oh boy, this is not working. Oh no. Oh boy. Uh, okay, well, but it is technically well made, I guess, and I really don't want the internet to be throwing things at me all fucking year, so... Okay, movie, I'm willing to be super generous and let you off with like a 5 out of 10 if you can just get to the end of yourself without having him deliver a big dramatic monologue about society and hypocrisy and all the stuff that the preceding film was supposed to convey but did not. Deal? And you did the thing. Okay. All right, okay, I'll give you one more shot if you can just maintain the courage of your original convictions that this was a one-off, unconnected, unique little experiment by not throwing in a gratuitous extra beat, leaving the back door open to syncing this up with the next wave of regular Batman movies if the fanboys demand it. Well, shit. So Joker isn't good. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I really am sorry. I wanted this to be good both because I sincerely want everything to be good since the world is kind of miserable and worthless enough on its own the last few years and it doesn't also need the entertainment to suck, but also I'm just already tired here on day one of the inevitable, well, you weren't 100% sold on the idea ahead of time and you said so, which means you were biased and paid off by Disney or whoever and just want every movie to be one of the Marvel things framing being applied to myself and every other critic that doesn't fall into line behind what I sincerely except was a well-intentioned but admirably ambitious misfire already. Now, partly because, you know, the sheer volume of irony involved in being lectured on deciding ahead of time to dislike something by people who already knew they were going to like it is frankly exhausting to cope with, but also because for a change, and rather surprisingly, Joker turns out to be the sort of bad movie that's bad mostly because it's so empty, unoriginal, and boring, with so little to actually say after all the self-insistence that the prospect of being forced to find more things to say about it even a week or two from now sounds like torment. In what's sure to become an infamously condescending press quote, Phillips claimed that he wanted to use Joker as a way to sneak a real movie in the studio system in the guise of a comic book film, but what he's delivered is more like a feature-length equivalent to one of those pop culture mashup t-shirts that you see on sale at these sketchy mall kiosks, you know, where like at first glance it's the poster for Scarface, but then you look again and it's not Tony Montana, it's like Vegeta, and you go, oh hey, that's cute. But then if you ask whoever the artist was, like, so is the juxtaposition of, like, the tormented immigrant's journey corrupted by the twin demons of American racism and capitalism as embodied in the Scarface narrative with Vegeta's Saiyan Dark Prince to Husband Father Redemption arc supposed to be, like, mirroring an ironic or contradictory symbolism? They're like, Juxtapahu. So it is with Phillips and Joker, or seemingly, wherein he smashes together the rough plot outlines of the most famous visual beats of Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, and also Martin Scorsese's The King of Comedy, complete with Robert De Niro cameo, and plugs a revisionist origin story for an iconic comic book bad guy into the villain protagonist spot for the ultimate purpose of saying, hey, if Scorsese or somebody had done a Joker movie in 1982, that would have been pretty hardcore, right? And not much else. The saving grace, yes, is that Joaquin Phoenix is is very, very good here. I'm not necessarily sure that it rates as one of his all-time great performances, especially recently, but he clearly came to play, and it's all the more impressive when you realize that there actually isn't that much on the page for him to work with. Joker is a series of scenes and ideas and mood moments borrowed from other movies, comic panels, and bits of media that are meant to remind us of what those were about and rekindle those feelings via transitive property, but it's not really about anything coherent in and of itself, so the fact that Phoenix makes Arthur Fleck feel like a consistent character is quite a feat, considering the film isn't giving him anything to work with beyond, okay, now here you're Travis Bickle. Now you're Defends from Falling Down. Now you're Lester Burnham. Now you're the guy from Fight Club. 
Okay, now you're the other guy from Fight Club. Now at least three different Sam Rockwell movies. Now officially, Fleck is supposed to be a luckless rent-a-clown and wannabe stand-up comic suffering from an unnamed but seemingly inspired by pseudo bulbar affect mental illness that causes him to break out laughing at inappropriate times, struggling through a miserable existence, caring for his sick mother, and daydreaming of appearing on a popular talk show hosted by De Niro's character in a crime-ridden 1980s Gotham City, where a crippling garbage strike has inspired tone-deaf billionaire Thomas Wayne to run for mayor on an only I can fix it because I'm rich platform. But when Arthur loses his cool and murders a trio of Wall Street types who were bullying him on the subway, it creates an urban legend of killer clown vigilantes stalking Gotham's wealthy 1% that spawns a clown mass class conscious protest movement that begins to engulf the entire city at the same time dark revelations about his own past, possibly involving Thomas Wayne himself, push Arthur over the edge and toward adopting the mantle of the Joker to continue adopting the mantle of the Joker, basically. It's not really a movie with much of an end game or a point, though it definitely thinks it has several points and proudly shows this off well before we get to the moment of the Joker literally and metatextually lecturing the audience about the true function of comedy and the fact that society, hey, we live in one of those, did you know? Being truly to blame for him being him, which frustratingly isn't even supported by the text of the plot. In fact, if Joker does have a coherent thematic or moral arc to call its own. It, it doesn't, but if it did, it would boil down to Fleck's journey of self-actualization through realizing that while society can be tough, the real cause of all of your problems is probably a woman. But, because this is a movie that's only constructed to confer a sense of meaningfulness and depth on its subject by borrowing the sense memory of meaning and depth from other, more familiar things, its narrative and thematic structure are all over the map. Fleck's personal journey and the Gotham class warfare uprising don't ultimately have anything to do with or say about each other. Splitting his authority figure fixations between De Niro's talk show guy and Thomas Wayne don't add up to anything other than fitting in more Batman stuff, and leaves both subplots underdeveloped. Zazie Beetz gets utterly wasted on a character who who makes no sense other than to set up a reveal that will be absolutely shocking to anyone in the audience who hasn't seen a movie before. And even its most sincere saving grace, apart from Phoenix's performance, the truly excellent 1980s Urban Decay production design ends up betraying the shallowness of its inception. Despite all the effort in recreating the late 70s, early 80s Scorsese New York aesthetic for Gotham, Joker's heavy-handed political illusions are all about Occupy, Anonymous, 99% classism acts, all pointed straight at 2019. And one of the major plot points involves one of our Arthur's stand-up routines essentially going viral, which was in no way a thing 30 years ago. In other words, it has no meaningful or important connection to the era it's trying so hard to take place in, other than to remind you that you're supposed to be thinking about Taxi Driver. <sighs> you know, guys, I, I wanted this to be good, too, because if we're going to have so many of these, people need to be able to go outside the box and do different mold-breaking stuff. But this isn't it. Joker is a shallow movie playing at being deep, a basic movie that thinks it's complex, and not even a particularly shocking or violent or weird or transgressive enough one to be outraged about in any meaningful way. It has nothing much to say, and yet it won't shut up. Four out of ten, mostly for Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, guess I'll go move into the panic room. Okay, it's Thanksgiving, unless you're watching this at any point other than the day it went up, in which case it is not Thanksgiving, but I'm sure it's nice then, too. And I don't really want to be making a long-ass video, but I know some of you have been relying on me for years now to provide a few minutes of holiday escape for when these things fall on a holiday, so okay, how about a Superman episode? So Warner Brothers had a big hit recently with Joker, and Shazam did pretty good, and even though everyone keeps feeling like any minute now they're going to wake up from a dream or some Mandela effect shit is going to kick in and this won't be the case, Aquaman somehow turned out to be worth a billion dollars worldwide, like, again, Aquaman, freaking Aquaman, billion dollars worldwide, Aquaman, really? That, that, look, I liked it, but still a billion dollars worth of people went to see Aquaman. Just, but, look, again, I thought Aquaman was good, but holy shit. Anyway, they're also about reasonably sure that the next Wonder Woman will be another big hit, because the first one was, so this one probably, and the Robert Pattinson as Batman movie will probably do fine, because it's a Batman movie, and so long as Zack Snyder and Ben Affleck are nowhere near it, because they're both busy doing things that they actually want to do and are good at, those always do fine too. So of course, the question has started up again as to when the attention is going to whip around again to making a good Superman movie, you know, that thing they haven't managed to do since that one time in the 70s, if we're just counting the feature films. It's not they haven't tried, it's just that every time comes 
so backloaded with baggage and frontloaded with weird momentum and bad luck, it's hard not to buy into the idea that the whole concept is legitimately cursed at this point. I mean, I don't care what kind of shape Henry Cable's in, he's playing with fire if he hasn't already called up Lloyds of London and gotten a policy out on his everything. The current scuttle is that Warner Brothers wants J.J. Abrams to come in and take a swing at it, having locked him into some sort of long-term development deal no one knows the full details of after it became once again clear that even though he's batting clean up on the third Star Wars sequel, he's not going to be taking over that whole wider project. That's kind of interesting if you've been doing this job for as tragically long as I have, have been able to watch these things evolve, because part of the genesis of damn near every shred of superhero movie versus the fandom versus oh no will actually incorporate the fandom nonsense we're involved in now began with Warner Brothers almost rebooting Superman a decade ago with a hugely ambitious pitch by Abrams, which would have drastically altered the character in his mythology. You've probably heard this one by now, Krypton didn't explode, the villain is Superman's evil uncle, so it's all very Lion King crossed with Dragon Ball Z and Dune, Superman's costume is alive and works like Venom, Lex Luthor is actually from Krypton as well, Superman has to die and get resurrected to get his full power set, it was a weird one. Anyway, the internet got a look at a review of a leaked version of that script pitch at the time and lost its collective shit, so that didn't happen. They made Superman Returns instead, and yeah, I know people have been working hard to reevaluate Superman Returns because of how much worse the movies that came out after were and how awesome Brandon Routh looks now as the Kingdom Comes Superman and the promos for Crisis on Infinite Earth, and it's so goddamn cool they're even doing that, and freaking Kevin Conroy is Kingdom Come Batman, how the hell is the CW still better at all of this than the movies are? Warner Brothers has had the money, A-list stars, Zack Snyder, and Joss Whedon to do a crossover movie, and they blew it. The network TV kids have been hitting the out of the park several years in a row with basically the community theater version. That's just nuts. I mean, I love it but it's nuts. Anyway, supposedly the mandate for whoever gets the gig of fixing the Superman movies is to make the character relevant again for 2019, which has already set off alarm bells that might change something or not change enough or whatever your preferred flavor of outrage was. It wasn't long ago that Michael B. Jordan was getting called into the studio with a Superman reboot pitch of his own, although apparently his card was too full to commit to a project that far out, so I guess it's not going to be him. It wasn't even immediately clear if he was being looked at to play the part or not, but you can imagine how that went down in some quarter. Not well, in case you were curious or needed to ask which quarters we're talking about. Things like that and the idea of relevancy overall always bring up the issue of whether or not it's even possible to bring this character that's considered so untouchably iconic into being in any kind of central way in an era so far removed from when his iconography was established. It's one thing when Superman is a supporting player in the various CW shows where he appears as essentially the classic gold and silver age incarnation of himself in deliberate old-fashioned hero guy contrast to the most of the younger millennial and Gen Z characters taking center stage. It's a whole other thing to work out as the centerpiece of a movie. Even the Christopher Reeve version ultimately found that the only way to keep the classic version while also fitting into the modern world was to stylize his small Smallville backstory as being hyper-anachronistic compared to the present-day Metropolis and make it a metaphor for the character arguing his own relevance to the audience, which was a conceit they didn't use in the subsequent three movies and probably isn't going to work again, you know, nearly as well as it did in the late 70s. I remain of the mind that they continuously overthink these kinds of characters. Seems to me if you can make a character as literally designed around being an anachronism in the 60s more popular than he's ever been in the 21st century like Captain America, it can't be that hard to do with Superman if the people involved would drop their own baggage, or at least be not so touchy about other people's. Like, okay, it's 2019, does he still need to be an alien? Sure, you need that immigrant story, but does he have to be a white guy? I mean, I don't think so, but if he's not, it probably should change his relationship to the rest of the world and how he's perceived by people, and if it doesn't change how Superman's experience goes, it should definitely be different for Clark Kent. And hey, that kind of sounds like a movie right there, if you ask me. Does Smallville need to be a farm in Kansas? Can it be a factory district in Detroit or a different kind of farm in Miami or wherever? I mean, it can't be lost on people that the closest we've gotten lately has been Supergirl, precisely because it's not expected to adhere 100% to an established model, especially when it's much closer in tone and setup to a Superman series than most of the various Supergirl incarnations that have existed in the comics over the years. Anyway, I'm sure someone will figure this out, because again, a billion dollars globally for Aquaman. Anything is possible. That's what I'm thinking on the matter, at least for now. Please pardon me while I go get some stuffing. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. This is the time of year when we start getting big trailers for what'll be the big movies of spring and summer, which is good for me because TV is in reruns and publishing is in holding patterns, so at least this show can have some fresh content. Last week we did a quick overview of the long-awaited Black Widow trailer, and now this week brought us the almost as long-awaited in some respects trailer for Wonder Woman 84, and the wow, they seem to have thrown this thing together, somewhat worryingly fast trailer for Ghostbusters Afterlife. Two movies with seemingly very little in common, but in actuality strongly united by the shared factors of being follow-ups to prior franchise IP revivals from roughly three and a half to four years ago that made terrible 
people, men, I guess, from the internet do a big sad face, and also both being heavily indebted to nostalgia from the 1980s because, well, turns out my generation is the last one that got to have anything resembling disposable income to spend into their adulthood for a while, so this right here, this is your culture now, Western civilization. But okay, so Ghostbusters is doing an 80s throwback feel, strictly in the sense that this one is now a direct sequel to the continuity of the beloved first movie, and the not even as almost sort of good as you remember it second movie because the attempt at trying something actually different last time was only an average box office performer instead of an outright smash, and well, I thought it was decent enough if plagued by the same good cast looking lost in a pre-visualized third act problems that a lot of average tentpole movies have of late. Got decent but not overwhelming reception from critics, so back to the drawing board, plus Ivan Reitman's son Jason was on board to take a shot this time. Oh, and it's also set in a small Midwestern town that still looks like the 80s, which means it still actually looks like the 50s, and they got one of the Stranger Things kids to be in it, so pretty much a feature-length adaptation of that production still of the kids dressed as Ghostbusters from that one season of Stranger Things. Yes, the trailer obviously makes it clear that one or more of the kids is the grandchild of the apparently deceased Egon Spengler grappling with family legacy, hence the peeling out Ecto-1 reveal here being almost beat for beat, the same as the discovery of the takeoff of the Millennium Falcon from the Force Awakens trailer, so I guess Reitman is working through some things, which is certainly very relatable. But the vibe definitely seems to be Stranger Things actual Ghostbusters edition, and it looks okay, interesting, probably. My question would be where all the jokes went. Like, I know Ghostbusters is a movie people were very attached to as kids, I was one of them, I even did a whole show about how it's got more going on under the surface than only the humor and effects, but the film is primarily a comedy. The whole franchise is, in fact, primarily a comedy. That's the entire hook of the whole Ghostbusters enterprise. Oh no, a giant Lovecraftian horror has descended upon New York City and... Oh, it's a, it's a giant marshmallow mascot? Oh no, terrifying ghostly apparitions are haunting the gothic columns and towering skyscrapers of Manhattan. Who will save us from... Oh, it, it's not wizards or priests or exorcists of any kind. It's just, like, pest exterminators, and they're played by dumpy asshole comedians from late-night sketch comedy shows? Like, that's pretty much the gag of Ghostbusters. I'm sure there will be humor in this. They can't possibly misunderstand their own material that badly, but it feels weird to lean this hard into we're taking this reverently seriously when being unserious and irreverent is literally what Ghostbusters was about. Like, the Ghostbusters song isn't even in there, and it feels like that would be partly because it wouldn't fit the tone, because that's a cheeky, bouncy dance song. I mean, the lyric is, Bustin' makes me feel good, not Bustin' makes me feel mournfully nostalgic about the whimsical time-loss quality of the vanishing American small town and symbolically the inexorable fading of my own more innocent youth and memories thereof. But I'm gonna remain optimistic. After all, I recognize that some of this vague sense of ambivalence might be the result of knowing that no matter what, the mere existence of this movie is going to be claimed as some kind of idiotic win by the toxic creeps who lost their minds about the previous one and already being tired of hearing about that. And I just got done making that whole Mandalorian an episode about not letting bad fans reflect onto the material because that's not fair, so practice what you preach, right? Odds are this will be fine. On the exact opposite end of the spectrum, you've got Wonder Woman 84, which is the part of this video that has to get trimmed a little bit for this YouTube version because the studio doesn't want us to show clips of their already publicly available, widely distributed movie commercial in this episode, apparently. Okay, then. Kind of a bummer, but policy is policy. Anyway, to put this in a shorter, we can only show stills version, the thrust of this part was the noteworthy 80sism of Wonder Woman 84, seeming to be more about topicality and maybe a light dusting of the P word, rather than the Wonder Woman versus Soviet spies or whatever people thought sitting at the height of the Cold War was going to mean, mostly in the sense that it's now extremely apparent that Pedro Pascal's incarnation of presumed main bad guy Maxwell Lord has been reimagined as a DCEU analog to circa 1984 Donald Trump in a really, really really obvious and unmistakable fashion. And, uh, well, just going with that look is pretty interesting, indicating that the filmmakers looked at all that analysis of the first movie that said their massive U.S. box office haul and the event status of its attendance gained in part among women and girls in particular was owed in part to a cathartic emotional release backlash to women specifically still reeling from the then-recent 2016 election disaster and decided... Okay, more of that then. Incidentally, Max Lord is not typically associated with being a Wonder Woman character in the comics primarily, save for one memorably infamous moment wherein he was acting as an antagonist. Uh, this is how that ended up for him. Yeah, so, so this whole thing should go over pretty quietly, I imagine. Otherwise, I think this looks decent. It's a little disappointing. We don't see how Wig looks in whatever Cheetah's final form is yet, but I like that she's here, and that swinging on the lightning thing is sick as hell. Realistically, all this has to do is at least be as good as the first one, but not run out of gas in the middle of Act 3 this time, and it'll be a big winner. So call me an optimist on both counts. We can probably still cool it with the 80s stuff uh, for, for a little bit, you know, gradually, soon enough, huh? I'm Bob, and that's the big picture.
Ah, someone save me from this maddening stretch of year covering entertainment industry happenings that can only infuriate me but also keep the lights on, or so I'm told. I don't actually work where the lighting bills get paid or do or not because the atomized nature of the modern digital workforce is such that, it, look, it's complicated. We live in a society, haven't you heard? Speaking of which, since this is the obligatory, hey, they announced the Oscar nominations and people are upset about things episode for the year, the big news, I guess, is that Todd Phillips' Joker is nominated for 11 prizes, which is exactly 10 and a half more than it deserves, and I say that mainly because the score is actually pretty interesting, so okay, that's nifty. Otherwise, I feel like this is something I'm expected to have a hot take about because I really didn't like the movie very much and the studio and filmmakers very successfully turned the release of this into one of those cultural event things where the existence of the thing is tied into some bigger socio-political discourse you have to have an opinion on and it has to be engaged in some big, wide-ranging argument, but really, honestly, I, I don't. It got nominated, whatever, I didn't care for it, some do, fine. But if we must talk about this, fine. The thing about this is, unlike some mainstream blockbuster event movies recently where it was implicitly the case that there was bigger stuff involved, like Black Panther, or where it became the case, like Wonder Woman or Captain Marvel, or whichever reboot of Ghostbusters were on at this point, like I said in my original review and subsequent episodes on the subject, because hey, I gotta eat too, Joker wasn't really all that interesting to me, or about anything, as far as I could tell, and there wasn't much discussion to be had. The closest you could get is to make note of how certain visual cues, musical motifs, gradations of cinematography, editing decisions, lighting choices, cultural and pop cultural references, and narrative perspectives can trigger or not trigger the correct parts of an audience subconscious that tells the conscious mind, take this seriously, this means something, versus the opposite, and well, there you go, we just did that, and shit, there's still a couple minutes to go for a full episode, so... Now, speaking only in my own opinion, since yes, I'm aware I'm slightly in the minority of folks who weren't really bowled over by this one, and again, I don't regard it as interesting or unique enough to be the worst or best of the year or any such thing, it's average, mediocre, whatever. Viewed apart from the storm of nonsense that's led up to it, Joker as an Oscar movie probably wouldn't be all that interesting as a phenomenon. Removed from the current context, it's one of the oldest and most overtold stories in the cycle of award season melodramas, and otherwise highly derivative, mediocre, sad man goes ballistic but it's not his fault because society movie, with pretensions of depth in which an over-their-head director piles on late 70s grime aesthetic and mimics their favorite shots from Scorsese and De Palma movies to prove they really do belong in the big leagues, elevated way above the attention level it would otherwise deserve by a big show-off improv heavy, crazy-go-nuts lead performance from a genuinely good, undervalued actor who's been much better elsewhere, frankly, and about whom the Academy feels guilty because, looking back, they probably should have given them the award a couple times before and didn't, so now they're gonna get it for the one where the non-specific over-the-topness of the role just let them bug the fuck out and do all their acting moves all at once in one film. Or, as it's called in Oscar parlance, pulling a Pacino. So yeah, look at me, I'm recognizable and disturbed in an entertaining way, give me an Oscar, is pretty familiar territory and would be wholly unremarkable if no less exhausting and irritating, but for its incidental connection to the weirdly cynical fake underdog hype machine around the movie, wherein a director who's made a bunch of hit comedies with huge stars and a hugely wealthy movie studio owned by one of the largest media conglomerates ever to exist in the history of humankind acted like a film spun off from one of their most popular entertainment brands starring the most popular villain character maybe ever, was somehow an underdog or oppressed or under attack project because it didn't receive universally positive acclaim from film critics right out of the gate, and a handful of other journalists and newspapers and whatnot had the temerity to report on its release that was being marketed as transgressive, shocking, irresponsible, and dangerous by asking, okay, is it those things? From where I sit, or if I had my honest way about it, that Joker is or isn't nominated in this or that category would be a very secondary discussion to more significant outrages, if anything about the Academy Awards could be called outrageous at this point. How was Adam Sandler not nominated for Best Actor for Uncut Gems? Or Lupita Nyong'o for Us? Jennifer Lopez in Hustlers? Eddie Murphy in Dolomite Is My Name? Two of the year's huge comebacks. Did they miss the farewell? Apollo 11 isn't up for documentary. Why? If two actresses from Little Women are both nominated and so is the movie, how is Greta Gerwig not up for Best Director? Did the movie direct its Self. Like, all of those seem to be more pressing to me. And yet, here we are, one day into Oscar campaigning, and the story of the season is apparently still going to be this unapologetically cynical but very successful sales pitch still working. Joker has the requisite pile of nominations that a genre movie that's still able to pierce the upper tier categories can rack up, but somehow the narrative is still that a film that but for the thin veneer of make-believe 70s style gritty nihilism and ultimately empty gestures at mental health and class-conscious wokeness wasn't really all that interesting, fighting for its place and trying to 
to end the stigma against comic book movies at the Oscars. And which stigma is that? The one that was already broken last year when the much more ambitious Black Panther became the first nominee for Best Picture from the genre? Or the one from over a decade ago when Heath Ledger posthumously won for playing the same character? Sure, it's possible, though unlikely given the somewhat staggeringly high caliber of the other eight films nominated, that it could become the first film to win in the genre, which would be a big deal, but are people rooting for the film at that point, or some trophy measuring contest between two companies that they aren't really benefiting from? And if so, why? Uh, how am I looking on time here? Oh, okay, yeah, so that's that's pretty much the best I can do turning Joker, fine, whatever, into an Oscars episode, folks. Uh, hopefully nobody else says or does anything else dumb related to this movie, and I can focus on more interesting things going forward. I'm Bob, and uh, that's the big picture. And then it was, in fact, 2020, and things were happening. CW's crisis event played out and effectively included a nod to suggesting that, well, something was indeed to be done about the failing and faltering DC movie universe, with Ezra Miller showing up for a uh, world crossover cameo with Grant Gustin. Nothing really came of it, and apparently uh, that may still be the case, but at the time, seemed like a big deal. Especially with Warner Brothers now having been wholly acquired by AT&T and expected to start turning a profit and driving sales to streaming platforms. <laughs> Uh, Birds of Prey landed as effectively a rebuke to really everything else happening in superhero cinema at that moment and the launch of what was already pre-announced as Margot Robbie's big development deal at Warner Brothers. From my end, it was actually looking like an emerging path forward here, a decidedly different but bumpy and coherent way that this could actually be righted, and not only could I imagine this all following, but, but it looked like they might really be going somewhere to some extent. And I was feeling so optimistic that I even called one of these episodes how DC got its groove back. So, uh, roll tape. Just as a forewarning, this is probably going to end up feeling a little shorter and light on the meaty side of things versus the purely speculative, but, you know, screw it. How often do I get to do a sequel to one of these? Anyway, about six months ago, amidst the early ramping up to Crisis on Infinite Earths, the 2019 to 2020 annual crossover event between the CW Network DC TV superhero shows, this year loosely inspired by the plot of the 1985's comic crossover of the same name, I decided to throw out a crazy theory. Mostly just to be completely honest about it, because while I figured it was mostly a tiny bit possible, it was also a good opportunity to tap on two of the most reliable third rails of superhero movie versus TV discourse, i.e. the still bitterly split fandom divide over the apparent dissolution of the so-called Snyderverse era of DC Extended Universe movies and the passionate fandom and equally passionate hatedom that's arisen around its more long-term successful mirror image in the aforementioned CW's Arrowverse. And, you know, traffic is business, business is money, I do have to live. Cutting to the chase, I posited that as much as the original comics crisis was ultimately a long-form justification for streamlining DC's then-Byzantine continuity issues by having its story end with the so-called multiverse, becoming collapsed into a single shared timeline, merging many of the most well-liked and frequently visited fictional realities and character teams together, but also taking the opportunity to undo unpopular decisions and delete some entire stories, characters, and whole worlds from existence, this TV crisis might take the opportunity to do the same for a Warner Brothers DC cross-media brand that's still in the process of putting itself back together after their big ambitious multi-film project for jump-starting a cinematic universe crashed and burned in slow motion at the box office as fans, audiences, critics, people really received the first wave of films with a resounding no, no thank you, no thank you, seriously, no thank you, stop, please just stop. <clears throat> Basically, wouldn't it be something if, just as part of the post-crisis housekeeping, they were to just casually throw out there, oh yeah, by the way, Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, Justice League, and Suicide Squad, that was all somewhere else in the multiverse and none of it happened anymore, and that's why there's going to be a new Batman and Superman, because crisis. Or, as I put it in the episode itself six months ago, titled, Will CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths Erase the Snyderverse from the DCEU? Oh, this, that, and the other thing that you didn't like, that never happened now. New timeline, butterfly effect, somebody stepped on a bug in prehistoric times, hyperspace, hyper time, sports almanac, whatever. And wouldn't it be something? if they were to just randomly drop the identifying clips from Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Justice League into the universe that ceased to be montage, and the movies just plowed ahead after that like they'd been doing in the default answer to any continuity thing from this point on was, nope, nope, hey, that was erased in the crisis. Never happened. That's really a cheat, isn't it? I guess you're right, Principal Tamzarian. I'll just be moving along, Lisa. Snowball too. 
Now, I'm not going to show the whole episode, but apart from that big reach of a guess, it was mostly a bunch of other speculation, and for a change, where I came up short was mostly in the spaces where I assumed they weren't going to go as big as they did. Crisis turned out to be a lot of fun. Like all of the CW's output in this regard, a lot of that fun depends on whether or not you can groove on an aesthetic that's essentially mashing together the upscale metropolitan relationship storytelling of a 90s network dramedy a la Ally McBeal or Boston Legal and the action sequences of a slightly higher budget Power Rangers set in Toronto, but in terms of sheer DC Comics fan service and genuine affection for the storytelling of their own characters and continuum, I've rarely seen this kind of thing done better at this level. As expected, the main storyline was devoted to sending up the concluding arrow and using the Crisis conceit to belatedly fuse the previously disconnected universes of Supergirl and Black Lightning with the one shared by Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, and Batwoman into a single continuity, but essentially, just because they could, the showrunners, through judicious use of cameos, archival footage, and clever editing, managed to turn the crossover into a genuine universe-spanning epic similar to the original comic that now officially establishes everything from Green Lantern movie to the forgotten Birds of Prey TV series, to the current Titans, Doom Patrol, and Swamp Thing shows, to Smallville, the 90s Flash series, Brendan Routh's Superman Returns, Kevin Conroy as an elderly live-action Bruce Wayne, the 60s Adam West, and 1989 Tim Burton Batman, all existing as part of the Infinite Earths multiverse. That's pretty damn cool. There is a malevolent force at work, one driven by a singular goal. Oh, I hope you're watching, big guy. The Crisis is now upon us all. Holy crimson skies of death! Now, I was expecting a couple of those, not all of them, and as you'll hear in this second clip from the original episode, I was definitely not expecting more than a cursory shout-out to the DCEU movies because it's TV. I mean, that's probably not how they're gonna do it. More likely, they'll dance around it thematically in each individual movie until they've got a new lineup people like enough that they won't care how the issue gets ignored. Crap, this is running long. But in any case, the current movies are probably too expensive to rate an appearance either way. One would have to imagine if they were going to pull Gal Gadot off set to fly out to Vancouver and shoot a cameo, we'd have heard about it by now. But about that. Literally. Found Barry Allen. No! What does that mean? How can this... You don't know about the... Oh my god, don't do this to me. I don't know about the what. You okay? I told you this was possible. possible. So that happened, and it didn't really end up having an actual bearing on the plot of the episode, and it was primarily a gag, probably so they didn't have to rely on it if it turned out not to be possible, but still, pretty cool. The entirety of the DC movie and TV history is now apparently in continuity with itself via multiverse theory, which effectively means everything matters and is always at stake, and also that nothing matters and there are no stakes. But what does it mean that Ezra Miller's Flash from the movie seemed to get blinked out of existence against his will? Did they actually do it? When they eventually make another DC movie that doesn't take place in the past or underwater, are we going to find out that in addition to gradually hosing down Zack Snyder's aesthetic influence on the various Justice League adjacent franchises, what with Aquaman and Shazam going in a more family action comedy direction and Wonder Woman 1984 looking to depart significantly from both her previous appearances or her film debut, the actual events and narrative of those films are gone too, that those movies officially don't count anymore? One can imagine the fan base still staging a literal protest movement over hypothetical alt-cut of Justice League will not be happy to hear that, especially in the context of this seeming deletion coming at the hands of the CW DC shows, which, while imperfect in their own ways, have come to be held up by many as an example, especially in terms of characterization and audience appeal, of succeeding where the films did not, along with offering an almost polar opposite take on the same kind of material, eschewing the faux-mythic bombast and hyper-masculine bellicosity with a progressive poptimist take on superheroics that merges Silver Age upbeat adventurism with social justice empowerment themes. Regardless, I imagine we won't know until the theatrical Flash movie comes out, which I believe is on its 8th or ninth new script and possibly double that many change creative teams and directors, but I get the sense the answer is going to be yes, sort of. It's probably not the case that global film audiences are going to be told, hey, everything's different now, sorry, you should have been watching that five-hour TV crossover two years ago, but it's been said pretty much since Justice League fell apart in theaters that the emergency escape plan for all of this was to use the Flash movie's plot as a way to soft reboot the movie continuity as well, so I imagine that Ezra Miller getting cleared to do this gag in the first place is an indication they're still going to do a version of that and maybe pop a version of this same scene in there as a callback, so maybe these two reboots can be thought of as one reboot if you care that much about that kind of thing. Uh, still, you know, we'll have to see. For now, I guess I kind of called it. That's fun. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Birds of Prey, or The Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn, is honestly kind of a fucking blast of a movie. It's really damn good, and it 
kind of feels like it shouldn't be like the component parts of this feel like someone should have made a mistake or at least someone should have thought they'd made a mistake and backpedaled and stopped it from being as unique and interested as it ends up being granted the whole second act of the warner brothers dc extended universe has had this general throw it against a wall and see what sticks feel to it you can kind of tell they were waiting to see what people think of the next batman before they commit to a real plan again after everything that went down with justice league but this really does play out like a movie that the casting crew put together over a weekend when no one was watching despite being headlined by one of the studio's biggest stars acting as one of their most protected licensed characters from their biggest brand i mean it's just not where you expect to see let's make a movie that's kind of about domestic abuse recovery and female friendship but mostly about recasting bad taste action comedy gags with a female voice but still in plenty bad taste to take root but apparently this is how much executive producer power margot robbie currently swings at warner brothers so good on her directed by newcomer kathy yan in a style best described as a very r rated tribute to the neon Fantasia Gotham City of Batman Forever but with a much better action choreographer and a much much better screenplay and despite the title order taking a much more form of a Harley Quinn status quo reset first and a Birds of Prey origin movie second the basic setup has Quinn on the run now that having publicly broken up with the Joker following the events of Suicide Squad she's no longer considered untouchable by all of the myriad other supervillains gangsters and other odd associates who have reasons to want her dead which given the high profile nature of those past associations causes her pretty Recommend to intersect in a convoluted on purpose fashion with the evil schemes of Ewan McGregor's wannabe supervillain crime boss Black Mask, whose killing spree through Gotham in search of a plot MacGuffin diamond quickly sweeps not only Quinn, but also his driver and lounge singer Black Canary, teenage pickpocket Cassie Kane, crossbow vigilante Huntress, and detective Renee Montoya into its wake. The actual connections binding all of these people together don't make a ton of sense and sort of doesn't feel like it's supposed to. The main thrust is that our cast of ostensible heroines and anti heroines are all survivors of trauma unjust systems and or abusive relationships, operating mainly as loners who end up having to lean on and work with each other in order to survive against the embodiment of all of that in Black Mask, whom McGregor does a great job of making feel like a fun buffoon villain until he's skin-crawlingly terrifying. Great bad guy. Perez also stands out as Montoya. It's fun to see her cast as the grown-up, grounded character among a crew of much younger women, and considering what a prominent figure this character often becomes in the Batman mythology, I hope they've signed her for more movies than this. Mary Elizabeth Winstead also gets to deliver a very fun, different-than-usual turn as Huntress, and Jenny Smollett-Bell is a very impressive new spin on Black Canary. Like I said, in terms of the Birds of Prey themselves, this is more of a high-we-exist light introduction for what they might grow into later than a full-on debut. But it is a set of solid, fun performances. The show floor, though, belongs to Rob Harley Quinn and to the degree that she really has forced this sucker through the studio as a showcase for everything she's capable of you can see the work all there on screen this is an all singing all dancing all kung fu fighting shotgun blasting gun fighting roller skating car chasing stunt leaping joke telling cry laughing screaming every other emotion in between look what I can do resume performance for the ages she works so hard proving and that she and only she can possibly embody this version of Harley Quinn to almost kind of forget that she already got the part now, it helps that Yan turns out to be a hell of an action director, knowing when to go with long takes, hard cuts, and makes judicious use of time-lapse and rewind gimmicks to give the humorously overcomplicated story a sense of linearity. Birds of Prey is a raucous, deeply strange piece of punk rock pop art that's probably as close as anyone has come to making a Takeshi Miike or Sion Sono movie or a trauma flick at a studio budget in years, and I especially appreciate the way it balances a thoroughly female-forward perspective while still committing to being as gleefully violent as any other R-rated action, or think Deadpool with kind of a glitter bomb aesthetic. So yeah, I'm giving this one a 9 out of 10. Very recommended. Check it out. As you may have heard by now, Warner Brothers' latest DC Comics feature, Birds of Prey, is getting surprisingly good reviews, despite opening in early February being more or less a follow-up to the financially successful but widely despised Suicide Squad, a controversial aesthetic and canonical departure from its source material, and a complete tonal 180 from the studio's most recent genre success in Joker, which it's sort of, by extension, tied to, kinda. Now, my review will hit on Friday, but since we're already allowed to say, I'm with the consensus in being pretty positive on this one. It's shockingly good and a fun time out, and unless R rating and or general overt weirdness, this is easily the closest that a major your studio has come to releasing something like a Takeshi Miike, Sion Sano, or Troma movie in recent years keeps people away, that should make this another big commercial and or critical success for the studio slate that was previously the cautionary tale of the industry. In fact, when you look at it objectively, it's striking to know that it's mainly the fact of the rival Marvel brand being so omnipresent and consistently strong that's made Warner's DC brand look as poorly managed as it has, along with the fact of their initial string of disaster luck, the mixed reception to Man of Steel, the violent rejection of Batman v Superman, and tepid shrugging off of Justice League, together all but eclipsing the genuine success of Wonder 
Woman coinciding with the string of other studio cinematic universe failures, but large ships take time to turn, and while it may have been too late to salvage Justice League, it did seem like the studio was trying to fix things while that was already in production, and since then it's largely been a string of successes. Aquaman was a global smash and completely different film from any of its predecessors. If you saw Aquaman, it was actually more like six or seven completely different films. Shazam was a hit and widely praised as a holiday family adventure. I didn't personally care for Joker, but a lot of people did, and 11 Oscar nominations are certainly nothing to sneeze at. Wonder Woman 1984 is looking like another winner, and now Birds of Prey I'd offer is a more creatively successful version of what Joker took aim at, i.e. using a name property as the vehicle for doing something very different within the studio system. On the TV side, many naysayers have been won over by the hugely ambitious Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover event, improvements such as series like Titans, offbeat entries like Doom Patrol, and a renewal for the critically praised Batwoman, among others. So while the pundit class for such things will probably make the mistake of waiting on a major ticket item like the next Batman, Superman, or Justice League do over to declare it so, it seems like they've turned things around. How did they do that? To be honest, it doesn't look so much like they changed strategy, so much as followed through on it. From the outset, the pitch was supposed to be that the differentiation of the so-called DC Extended Universe to Disney's Marvel Cinematic Universe and the superhero genre was the lowered emphasis on connectivity, which really is more of a sleight of hand trick in the Marvel than an actual policy, but that's another show, in favor of placing a premium on authorial voice and creative autonomy for individual projects, such as it is within the studio system. But that plan seemed to run counter to the outside place that the Justice League adjacent projects had early on, with director-producer Zack Snyder's long-term plans and aesthetic choices apparently holding sway not only over the tone and design, but also plot details of Suicide Squad and Wonder Woman, among other features, leaving the whole project somewhat in disarray when a combination of personal tragedy and apparent breakdown and cooperation between the studio and himself saw much of the production stopped and retooled. Now, it seems, the original letting the movies be their own thing plan is back on track. You can imagine these various characters in Birds of Prey, Shazam, etc., bumping into each other between films, but on their own, they're very much doing their own thing. It's almost as though the acceptance of the fact that no one is going to compete with Marvel at the A-list mainstream superhero level has freed up the DC films to embrace being the weird alternative misfit brand, which should certainly make things interesting when it's time to do, like, Superman again, but that's for another day. It also seems like they followed Marvel's lead and that they've stopped listening exclusively to fans and started listening more to audiences, because those aren't necessarily the same thing. Say one thing for Batman v Superman and the rest of the so-called Snyderverse, it's probably the purest deep dive any studio has or now will ever take into the absolute uncut id of the closed-off, gate-kept comic book store nerdcore elite milieu of cardcore, we're the real fans, here's what we want, gritty solipism. The cinematic apotheosis of the kind of Drek Frank Miller and company have been churning out for the last decade and change. No wonder actual moviegoers bounced off it like a force field. Whereas Marvel Studios, at least from about the point where Kevin Feige took total control of the movie side of things and pushed Ike Perlmutter to the side, has been asking the popular culture to tell them what it wants, finding what they have to fill that in the archives, and when they don't have it, making it so they can use it later. For DC, Aquaman turned out to be something that a billion dollars worth of audiences worldwide didn't know they needed. Shazam is quietly working its way to being a multicultural holiday classic on home video, and that's before they add the rock to the franchise next couple years. Joker clearly clicked with its own audience, and now Birds of Prey seems to be scratching an entirely specific itch for female action fans. This is the kind of thing that comes from looking not just at what your existing fan base wants, you've already got their money after all, but instead at unfilled spaces in the rest of the culture and asking, what do we have that can go there? I'm Bob, and that's the... The last of the big picture episodes you just saw, the Got Its Groove Back one, ran on February 6th of 2020. Five days later, the World Health Organization would announce for the first time that the virus outbreak that was sweeping China was originally known as SARS-CoV-2 was now to be designated COVID-19, an abbreviation for Coronavirus Disease of 2019. Two days later, the 15th case of the disease would be confirmed in the U.S. On February 29th, the Center for the Disease Control reports the first confirmed American death from COVID, adding to a mounting toll of thousands globally. Ten days later, March 11th, the WHO WHO declares the disease officially a pandemic. With the United States government then under the well-documented mismanagement of the Donald Trump administration, the U.S. ultimately never undergoes a full formal national lockdown policy to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Instead, while several significant pieces of relief legislation are put forward by lawmakers and eventually signed off on, individual states, districts, organizations, companies, and individuals are largely left to work out their own policies, integrating with social distancing measures and public health policy implemented by federal agencies like the CDC see while awaiting further guidance on vaccines, relief, care, and so on. Eventually, over 1,100,000 people will die, and that number continues to climb. In the midst of this, measures states and businesses do take at slowing the spread, flattening the curve, etc. begins to dramatically change the landscape of American and indeed global life almost instantly, shuttering restaurants, stores, public spaces, schools, offices, transforming workspaces, utterly reshaping the culture of media in ways that felt in some respects like a hypercharging of inevitable trends, but also like being thrown into an unfamiliar ocean altogether, and while I feel the need to stress that it's so dramatically not the most 
most important thing when weighed against the deaths and the socio-psychological impact and everything else, literally. The massive, massive, massive impact this had on the state of an entertainment and media arts business which had just spent a decade of change contorting itself to primarily exist in the always-on, 24-7 continuum of narratives where the movie or the show was only part of a bigger thing that didn't stop and this had become the way everything was marketed and kept going just can't be overstated. And not just in super obvious ways, like how the Shazam movies basically got ruined because they're about kids turning into adults and they now had to pause between sequels and the kids grew up, or how the Marvel stuff had this whole big snap blip dusting resurrection thing built into it as a way to jump the continuity forward so phase four, five, and six movies could do a generational passage storyline and instead it gets morphed by the world into this much more topical allegory unavoidably. The fact is, I do believe that the powers that be at Warner Brothers in DC had a general idea of where they were going or at least what they needed to do to pull themselves out of the Zack Snyder, Joss Whedon tailspin at the beginning of 2020 and had the world not stopped for much bigger, much more tragic, much more important and relevant things, yeah, it's one of those things that would have been different. I don't even necessarily know that it would have been that different from what we're about to see them do now with James Gunn in charge and the post-Flash timeline, but all the more reason to cut part of this off here because, yeah, this did end up being where the first half of this, if not the real and fictional old worlds, ended. This was the real first ending of the DC Extended Universe as a film project, because it hasn't gone forward since, at all. Pretty much everything that was known or believed to be the case by people who had any business knowing at this point in the story, that the Snyderverse was basically dead, that Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck were not going to be reprising their parts in any meaningful way, that the studio was looking to drastically pivot to a new direction, and the eventual key to doing so was to just reboot everything using some sort of Flash movie as a way to justify it. That that was the plan then, and it's still pretty much the way things ended up being and are now. So when we reconvene, it's less to tell the continuation of a story that already covered about eight years of pop history than to re-examine, well, really only two years of abject cultural chaos that followed. A disaster in motion that in some respects is still in motion. It just simply felt like another whole eight fucking years. Join us, won't you? Until next time, I'm Bob, and this has been one very big picture.